Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Uh, well, now, it's ten years today since UK banks received a £500 billion bailout from the British taxpayer amid a catastrophic financial crisis. The age of austerity that followed has been long and painful for many. Sky News analysts uh, show that UK growth has remained sluggish in the years following the crisis, with a recovery even worse than America's Great Depression. Our economics editor, Ed Conway, has this special report. Ten years ago today, the day everything changed. The banks were bailed out, the financial system flirted with oblivion. This country's unhappiest economic saga began. Had the banks not been rescued, it, it would have been unimaginably desperate. The entire system was not working and was going to collapse. People were visibly scared. We were right on the brink, right on the edge. But a decade on, we are still asking the question, have we really recovered? Why is the economy still so weak? Why are so many people talking not about regeneration, but about decay? Nobody can see a promising future, so nobody dare plan for the future too far ahead. Austerity, it's, it's been a huge problem. When I become homeless, it really did open up my eyes. So we're asking whether the past decade should really be thought of as Britain's Great Depression. For the people in charge ten years ago, the scars can still be felt today. I suppose the most uh, vivid memory is the morning of the 8th of October ten years ago when I took a call from the then chairman of RBS. The bank that was hemorrhaging money, there was a run on it, its shares had been suspended in the stock exchange, and he said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, but how long can you last? And there was a pause and he said, we're going to run out of money in the afternoon. If people worry and try and withdraw lots of cash, can you fill them quickly enough? Also security issues around if people are going to take sort of bundles of cash around. There was a lot of talk about there's going to be a great depression like the early 1930s. I knew there wasn't going to be because I knew that we knew what not to do and what to do. When people say that our politicians, our then Prime Minister and Finance Minister, stepped into the breach and avoided a complete disaster, I think that's basically true. But now, new analysis from Sky News underlines the scale of that crisis. These lines show you the path of GDP, how the size of the economy changed in a few famous British recessions from history, the 90s and the 30s. A dip, then a recovery. But now look at these lines. The red one is the recent crisis. The blue one is the American Great Depression that began with the 1929 Wall Street crash. Our recent recession was far less deep or dramatic than the American 1930s. But look at what happened next. The US economy bounced back quickly in the 1930s, dipped slightly and then surged again, while Britain simply failed to take off after this crisis. The upshot is that this year, a decade on from the slump, Britain's cumulative growth is now smaller than America's was 10 years after the Great Depression. It's a staggering statistic, and perhaps that explains why even now, 10 years on, some workers feel the country has never truly recovered. The steel industry suffered a deeper crisis than most. Today, veteran steel workers feel they're constantly fighting for survival. Just pure worry. You don't know where you're going, what you're going to do. You don't know if you've got a job next week. I mean, we lost a lot too many 2008, 2009, and just don't know what's happening. Your life's on hold. Well, it's been tough for my family in the sense that my son lost his job. He was with me when the plate mill shot um, in Scunthorpe. My brother-in-law lost his job. How much money did they actually pour into the banks to bail the banks out, the government? Don't we've had nothing. Close, but... The answer, by the way, is £133 billion, pounds, or more than a trillion by some measures. The idea was we'd all benefit, but try telling that to these guys. A place like Scunthorpe, said, there's just nothing there. You take that steelworks away, you've got a ghost town. There's just nothing. There's that many men out to work. So they decide to sell their houses, house prices for them. Yes, to probably you can't sell your house because there's nobody up there where anybody wants to buy it. I always remember in 2008 we started weathering the storm and I still believe that we're still weathering the storm. 
I don't think that we've ever come out of it. We've never seen, seen no sunshine. So why? Was it the crisis, the banks, or what happened after? The cuts. We must pay down this deficit. This emergency budget deals decisively with our country's record debts. Yes, it is tough, but it is also fair. If you don't know what the deep cause is, you've got to find solutions that will help whatever the deep cause is. The real cost to the United Kingdom is the economic cost of how they handled the years that followed. And the obvious thing to do would have been spending on the infrastructure. They thought they could eliminate the deficit and in a five-year period, which I think is wildly optimistic. Austerity, cutting government borrowing, arguably the most controversial economic policy in recent years. But away from the boardrooms and the statistics, what does it actually feel like on the ground? We get loads of support um, from the local community, local schools, churches. And... Kerry runs a homeless charity in Harlow, offering everything from a warm meal to help with job applications. The government says, well, listen, we've, we've got through the, the worst of it. Things are getting better now. Do you, do you recognise that kind of on the ground? I don't think we're seeing that just yet. Right. Not here. The average number of homeless people sleeping on the streets on any night in 2010 was six. Um, we've just reviewed our figures now and for our last financial year the average number of homeless people on any given night in Harlow was 23. Okay, so, wow. Okay, so it's kind of... It's quite an fact, increase factors, and that's so, been yeah. increasing year on year on year, not right. only in Harlow but, you know, across the UK. A challenge, in other words, which seems to be getting worse, not better for those who've had to live out on the streets. It's hard. I mean, sometimes I was sitting there, it was so cold in my tent. I was sitting there thinking, I just about like, committing a petty crime to get myself thrown in prison, like, to get yeah, out of the cold. Yeah. yeah, that's how bad it can get. Yeah, um, no, no, no. Some people, it. I've known actually people to actually go ahead and do that. Like, all this about eradicating it in 2022, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It really ain't, unless someone really steps in and starts pumping some money into this. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. When there's always, uh, the way I see it, where, where there's rich people, there will always be poor people. But tough as it is, according to Rupert Harrison, George Osborne's chief advisor and one of the architects of austerity, the pain was unavoidable. We can't think about what happened 10 years ago as a sort of sudden event that hit the UK economy from out of the blue. Uh, this was the culmination of a decade, at least in the UK, of a very, very unbalanced model of growth. Austerity was not a choice. It was a situation the UK found itself in. We found ourselves in 2010 as probably the most vulnerable major economy in the world. Uh, and we had to make some very difficult choices, and they were very, very controversial. The macroeconomic story in the UK has been a successful one. I think the challenges we face are longer term and more global. The funny thing is, that's not a defence you hear much in politics at all these days. Indeed, the politics forged by the crisis are very different to what came before. What you've seen is a growth of populism. It's not confined to this country and Brexit. It's, you know, it's right across the globe, from the uh, election of Donald Trump and then the uh, protectionism that we have here, the Brexit vote in Britain, populism, anti-immigrant feeling around uh, uh, Europe. The last few years, I've really felt that I actually want to make some kind of change, and, right. um, and I want to make a change here in Harlow. Campaigners from Momentum, the left-wing group so influential in the Labour Party, believe the past decade has proven the need for change. Campaigners like Laura. We've seen the rich get richer as the poor get poorer, definitely since the recession 10 years ago. I don't think we're out of the recession. Certainly it still feels like we're in the recession in Harlow. There's no affordable housing. Um, a lot of the manufacturing ha is, has gone offshore. Um, and I think that actually that's one of the Labour Party's policies, is to bring back manufacturing to the UK. I hope you don't mind me saying this. Sounds, some of that sounds a bit like the kind of message that Donald Trump is... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the intriguing thing is these kinds of concerns about the role of capitalism aren't just to be found amongst left-wing activists, but also in the highest echelons of the establishment. The economy, the capitalist system, is not delivering for ordinary people in the way it seemed to be doing uh, before 2007. And that's the crisis which I think is still unresolved.
I think people are legitimately angry about something that's gone deeply wrong with capitalism. We have a whole load of people who, in 2018, have real wages which are below where they were in 2007, and in the case of America, some of them below where they were back in the 1980s. And blaming everything on austerity isn't quite fair. What if there's something else going on? What if the financial crisis was simply the moment we realised there was a deeper problem in the economy? Quite simply, we're not productive enough. We're fundamentally building products that will go to milking cows, to packaging crisps, to cutting metal, to putting a conformal coating onto a mobile phone to make it waterproof. Tony Haig runs a high-tech manufacturing firm in the Midlands. As with so many others, he still bears the scars from a decade ago. It was an incredibly fraught period. Uh, never before, certainly in our industry, had we seen such a, you know, a, a global economic meltdown. It wasn't just a recession in one industry. It was far more than that. I mean, to put it into context, in the space of four weeks, we saw a 70% reduction in orders from our customers. Four so, weeks? In four weeks, 70% reduction. A lot of manufacturing companies that were, you know, really good manufacturing businesses 10 years ago and now they're the site of a supermarket, a petrol station or a housing estate because they didn't do the right things, they did all the wrong things, they didn't invest and ultimately they couldn't compete and they closed. In other words, was the crisis just another excuse for businesses not to invest in their future? It's a concern for UK manufacturing in general because you know, we now all of us work in a global economy. And if they're not investing in automation, not doing the right things, will you be there in five years? The Great Depression is rightly remembered as one of the worst catastrophes in economic history. So whether you blame the banks, austerity or weak productivity, is it really fair to compare Britain's past decade with that? The last 10 years have been grim for all of our economies. Some grimmer for some than for others. But thank God we did not revisit the Great Depression. We didn't have, you know, a third of the entire banking system just collapsing and defaulting. That's what happened in America in 1929. And that's what happens when you simply say, I'm not going to spend any public money on rescuing a banking system. Just let it, let it fall. We avoided the banking system collapsing. But then, of course, the bigger problem, actually, if people say, what's wrong today, is the economic crisis uh, that flowed out of the financial crisis. But what if, after 10 years of struggle, it's now time to celebrate? What if the cuts are finally about to come to an end? After the financial crash, people need to know that the austerity it led to is over and that their hard work has paid off. <laughs> well, we'll see. But while we may not have faced the extremes of destitution America faced in the 30s, it's clear that Britain's very different type of depression is not quite over yet. And it's now exactly 10 years since the government poured hundreds of billions of pounds into Britain's banks uh, to stop the financial system collapsing. And in a moment, we're going to discuss why the UK economy has been slower to recover than the United States was after the Great Depression. First, though, here's a quick reminder of the, what led up to that event in 2008. The crisis began a year earlier here with Northern Rock when the money market stopped lending following the crisis in the US subprime mortgage market. Fears that it could go bankrupt prompted a run on the bank, the first for 150 years. Five months later, the Treasury took the historic decision to nationalise Northern Rock. This so-called temporary measure lasted nearly four years. In September 2008, the American bank uh, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, prompting worldwide financial panic. And six months after Northern Rock had come under state control, Gordon Brown used taxpayers' money to rescue the mortgage lender Bradford and Bingley, paying £42 billion for its mortgage book. Then on the 8th of October 2008, uh, that is uh, exactly 10 years ago, the Chancellor Alistair Darling announced that the government would launch a £500 billion fund bailing out some of the country's biggest banks, uh, including the Royal Bank of Scotland, Lloyds, TSB and HBOS to prevent the collapse of the UK banking sector. So uh, why has our recovery from that been so slow? Joining us to discuss that are... Sky News' economics editor, Ed Conway, the former deputy governor for financial stability at the Bank of England, 
uh, Sir John Geeve, Catherine MacLeod, who was the advisor to Alistair Darling, and Torsten Bell, director of the uh, Resolution Foundation, who also worked in the Treasury as a member of the Council of Economic Advisers during the financial crisis. Welcome to you all. Now, Ed, first of all, we, we've laid it out, very slow recovery. Ed, tell mm. us about it. And, and it's, we were in the process of making a film about you know, 10 years on since that, that moment, and I think many of us can remember you know, where we are when it was happening. But the striking thing, talking to a lot of people, was just how weak the recovery has been since then um, and actually looking back at the data and we've got a chart that can show you this looking back at the data we knew that we had the weakest recovery since you know pre every previous recession in UK history and let's just have a look at some of those previous sessions so that's that's the path of the UK economy UK GDP since 2008 you can see we had that dip and a very shallow recovery since and we knew even at the time that it was weaker than we saw in the 1990s it was weaker than we saw to uh, in the UK version of the 1930s we didn't actually have that bad a Great Depression in the 1930s ourselves but what we didn't know was that we are now doing worse comparatively a decade on than the US was 10 years after uh, the Wall Street crash of 1929. You can see they have far deeper uh, recession, a far greater unemployment. This, this was, it's difficult to compare the two. But the interesting thing is just look at the UK since about 2012, so about 13, 14 um, quarters after the, after the actual recession itself. Such a weak recovery and that's really the story of the past 10 years. You haven't had a recovery that has felt like it to a lot of people. And whether that's down to the banks, whether it's down to other issues like productivity or down to, to greater challenges shared by many other countries around the world, we're still debating. And, you know, we're still debating the causes of the Great Depression as well, for that matter. And we will still continue to debate why this recovery has been so weak. But I think, you know, whether that's RBS or other things, that is the big story of the economy at the moment. Uh, Sir John, does it follow from that that we did the wrong things 10 years ago, bailing out the banks? Now, we started the crisis badly with Northern Rock. We fumbled that rescue. We did rescue it, but we fumbled it. But actually, the, 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 the package to, to save RBS, HBOS and the banking system was something we did rather well and, in, in a way, led the world. Because if you remember, Lehman's had gone bust. The Americans had announced, the American government had announced the need for a massive reconstruction, and Congress had rejected it. And that feeling that the, the authorities had completely lost their grip led to a complete closure of the money markets and it was the British package which was the first which in a sense restored us. But there is an grip. argument now that actually we should have just let some of these things go bust because uh, you know in the end taxpayers have paid to save the financial sector not to save themselves and you know more things went bust in the Great Depression as we saw the recovery was quicker. Yeah, but the Great Depression was infinitely worse than the recession we had uh, 10 years ago. If you look at those, it was much shallower. Think of the mass unemployment even in the 1980s after that recession was far worse than the unemployment we've seen over this recession. So I think saying, bring it on, it'll only, be, it'll only last 10 years uh, is, a, is a fairly facile idea. Now, of course, we were right to stabilise the system. I think a point worth making following your report is that, and it was a collective failure of the government and journalism that we didn't make this point at the time, that the government did not intervene to save the banking sector. It did save the banking sector, but it was doing it to try and keep the economy afloat. And if they hadn't gone in to, make the, to save the banking sector, who knows what would have happened to the economy? Roger and Torsten. And we'll just start with some even more, I mean, Ed's quite a depressing guy, but even more <laughs> depressing than Ed's charts. That chart is showing you uh, GDP, the GDP recovery. Our actual recovery, which we care about, which is GDP per capita per person, which is what we really care about, uh, is much, much weaker than that chart shows. And that's because most of the recovery we've seen in recent years has just been driven by having more people. The, um, now, what's underlying that? Horrendous, the chart's now popped up in case anyone wasn't mm. depressed enough. The, what's driving that is horrendously weak productivity growth and that is really why we've got this disaster yeah, well, in the last 10 years. That's the underpinning problem. Now, in terms of rescuing the banks, I'm afraid I'm with John. I think the idea that letting the banks just go to the wall would have helped anybody apart from leading that line to be significantly lower is for the birds. Yeah, but it might have... Uh, I mean, again, you come to this point about employment and productivity. 
I mean, because we have record employment is one of the reasons why we have such low productivity, isn't no, it? Okay, you want to get into it. Why do we have record employment levels in this country? Because the nature of this recession was a huge depreciation of sterling, 27% falls in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. That led to a spike in inflation at the same time, which meant that the real wage adjustment, the way in which we became poorer, was much quicker through earnings. We are, everybody was poorer, rather than having all of the pain of the recession concentrated on a few people that lost their jobs. This is definitely a better way to do it, but the underpinning thing is it'd be better off not to be poor in the first place. But I just want to wonder, yeah, I, I wonder why it is, and, we, and there is no definitive answer for this, but why is it that the UK's recovery was so much worse than so many other countries around the world? You know, we all face a lot of those same productivity challenges. But, you know, I just wonder, Sir John, you know, was there anything when you look back that you might have done differently, you know, and do you think it's because the UK had such a big financial system? I mean, that's the that argument, we faced... isn't it? We, we were more exposed than anybody else because the financial sector was a bigger part of our economy. Well, that's definitely true. It's our most successful industry, has been for a long time, and it was very hard hit by what was a world crisis. Remember, this was born in the USA. but. Nonetheless, of course that was a problem, and that's part of the reason we've had a bad 10 years. The main reason is we haven't seen a resurgence of investment, and that's really the, the, the key to the productivity. In a way, the labour markets work rather well. Unemployment this recession has not been nearly as bad, even as the, the 90s recession, let alone the 80s. But that, but investment has been very Yeah, but you weak. see, but that's another point, that, you know, there was quantitative easing, but all it did was it built up the balance sheets of the banks. It did, uh, and even though their money was cheap, it somehow didn't flow to the people who needed to invest. Well, I think there's also a question of people wanting to invest. I think, uh, you know, this is social psychology, I'm not an expert, but I think it, it yeah. was a big shock and businesses have been much more cautious, not just banks having less money to lend, but businesses being much more cautious about investing. The government could have used, as it were, it could have been used in another way. We could have had great public projects, great infrastructure well, we projects. Could, we, could, we, could, we could. I mean, what's the look? But just to be fair to governments 10 years ago, and actually even less than that, we have consistently underestimated how bad this was, in the same way that RBS didn't yeah. understand how bad their situation was in the immediate run into the crisis, we have consistently underestimated how bad this recession was. In the middle of the crisis, we thought this would all be over in two or three years, now it comes along ten years later and tells us it's all a disaster. And that, but the reason why policy possibly yeah. under-responded under to the crisis is because we didn't understand that that is the kind no, of crisis we well, We're trying we to learn the lesson for the future, and then, for example... Well, look, the lesson is, the lesson is always assume it can be worse on the way yeah. in than you think it is. But Jeremy Corbyn's answer to this is basically we need more straight intervention and more direction in the economy, and the case has been made for that, Catherine, do you think? Um, well, it certainly has been made. I mean, whether it is, will be a success is um, debatable. And if we, you'd accept that that argument is, is right. No, I'm not saying it's been right, I'm saying it's been made. Um, and whether the country can afford it is debatable. If, we, if you know, where it is going to end up, I don't know, because he seems to have found it far too many uncosted promises to date. I, have, I mean, have we had too much, too much laissez-faire, not enough intervention? I don't, I, don't, I don't see that as the problem. I think it's uh, r restoring confidence and I think you're right that there was an opportunity, as we now see it, to do a lot more infrastructure spending through the last ten years than perhaps we thought there was at the time. And I think that, that has been a bit of a missed opportunity, which might have added a few points to the growth rates. At the end of the day, you know, Torsten's saying this is a complete disaster. This isn't a complete disaster. We've had 1% growth a year for 10 years, which is less than we're used to. But it could be, remember, it could have been worse well, than that. Well, a drop in real-term incomes. Um, we're now back above, uh, back, above pre-crisis yeah. income levels. Earnings, though, are significantly yeah. below average pre-crisis levels. Yeah. Right. They're the worst, the worst decade for so, on almost all the basis of all of these statistics. Right. And that's, that's the explanation okay, so for... So why, why is America doing better now? Well, I, one explanation, and th there is no single explanation, but one explanation might be, and this goes back to, to what we were talking about earlier, you know, they forced all of their banks to take at least some capital, whereas we didn't, and their banking system did recover a bit more, bit more quickly. And I wonder whether, you know, had the UK forced some banks that didn't want to participate in the, the operation to take some of that capital, like Barclays, for example. then it, perhaps the system might have recovered, but then... That would have saved us from a fraud, but it might have saved alleged fraud. Would that have made any difference, do you think? 
No, I don't, I don't think forcing Barclays to take ca taxpayers' capital would have uh, done anything except perhaps it led Mr. Varley to have an easier life. But yeah. um, the, uh, no, I don't think that was it. I think the Americans did give the banks a much softer deal than we did. So they didn't take 50% uh, plus of the equity and they didn't force them to change their business models. So in a sense, they, they were... They, they did let did, Lehman's go, though. They, so, and, and, they, made a, uh, they made a catastrophic error with Lehman's. And Bear Stearns. But, they, uh, and... but no, they saved Bear Stearns. They led everyone to think they'd yeah. got a grip. Then they convinced everyone they'd lost their grip. But in the end, they gave them the capital at very cheap terms and in terms which was easy for the banks to pay back. And although that's most unjust and it was even worse than what we did in sort of popular vision, nonetheless, I think it helped the banks get out of it quicker than our banks. And it is, and it is worth reflecting 10 years on you know, the British the British mega banks, but like what's happened to global banking in those 10 years? A big consolidation, a US and some parts of European dominance, and Britain's role at the global level significantly reduced. And what, what, what about the sort of the moral lessons of this? Do you think there were sufficient moral lessons? You know, there's a constant cry of why did no one go to prison? I mean, we know uh, Sir Fred, Fred the Shred lost his knighthood, but that was about it, wasn't it? The, um, I think there's, I don't know who it was recently, I think there is a case for a bit more morality in our political economy. The, um, and it definitely hasn't been a great year, 10 years for that. And I think the public not hearing people say sorry uh, was a large part of what went wrong. Mm -hmm. Is we well, I think few people said sorry, but the, I think what the public hate is that so many bankers are still earning millions of pounds. What do you think? Moral well, I lessons think, or uh, I, I, I think there aren't new moral lessons. I mean, one of the points, should one, be, of, the, one of the depressing depression. things about sort of Brexit, right. which is another, another, another right. thing, is it always convinces everyone that what they always thought was right. And so around this table, we can all agree that inequality is, the, is, is terrible and that must be at the root of the problem. But um, I, no, I think uh, the, the, there was bad banking and on the whole, the bad bankers have not done very well. The new bankers are doing fine. Okay. The bad bankers didn't pay any price. We will leave it there. Thank you very much indeed.